As I said, my name is Jeremy Kriegel. I'm the user experience and UX manager at a company called CIDC, which stands for Cambridge Interactive Development Corporation. It's hard to get a more generic name. But um, we do online corporate gaming, the subject matter, much more interesting. Now, we don't serve the US market, so there's no worry about any FBI agents coming and dragging me out during this presentation, which we'll get to the end. Um, I've been in UX for more than 15 years now, and I've worked in a lot of different places. I've worked on, uh, on, as a consultant for an agency. I've worked as a self-employed uh, self consultant. I've worked on internal teams. And I've been working in agile groups for about the last five years. That's just, that's, that's my quick, that's my NASCAR slide. And uh, you know, but, so, today I'm going to talk about, you know, who is the user of your stories. So, whether you write requirements using this format, if you've been around agile at all, you've probably come across user stories as a way of capturing requirements. As a, as a user, I want to accomplish some goal so that I get some value. Now the easiest thing, most of where we spend our time is we look at the goal, the, the need of the requirement, what it is that, that someone wants to do because we're going to have to build something there. And sometimes we also think about the value because it helps validate you know, what, what we're going to build. But it's going to be very hard to figure out well, who are we building it for because if we understand them, it, it changes the other two. Um, and it's much easier as for us to think about other things. For example, if we're engineers, it's easier to think about the computers, the machines, what makes them happy. They're in front of us, and they will tell us very quickly if they're not happy. Um, it's easy to think about what, they, what makes these guys happy, which is usually lots of this. Um, but we have to remember that money to a corporation is like air to a person. We need it to breathe, but if you're living to breathe, you're missing the point. Uh, and it, anyway, most people will agree that if you can solve a legitimate problem, People are using more than happy to hand over large amounts of money, and then everybody's happy. Now, it's not just about customers, and this applies to satisfying internal businesses as, as well. So if we all agree, we all can agree, or at least make me happy to agree, that uh, understanding who we're building for is a good thing, how do we get there? Well, today, for many of you who had the experience, it usually starts with, well, well I, I think this, and then, well, I think, we have a room full of people all with slightly different opinions. And sometimes it can be very hard to reach consensus. Sometimes it ends up just that the loudest voice in the room wins, not so good, or the most senior voice in the room. And that's not all bad, because at least you get to a decision. But if it's not a, a consensus among the people, the team can feel left out. And, and reaching that consensus among the, all these divergent opinions can be very challenging. The other bad news for the, the loudest and more senior voice is that there's no correlation between being the best talker and having the best ideas. This is personally bad news for me because I like to talk a lot. Um, so the first thing we have to realize is that you are not your users. Right? We are different. Um, we spend our lives with our products, day in and day out. Our users they only engage with us once, maybe once a week, once a month. And even for those people who use the product day in and day out, they're using it to get something done. We're involved in trying to build it, so we still relate to it in a very different way. So again, how do we figure out what they need? The obvious answer is to ask them. And this works out fine if you have to be developing software for an internal team. If you're building something for finance, go ask finance what they need. Talk to them. If you have a question, walk out the hall and talk to them. But most of us don't have that kind of direct access. Maybe we don't have it at all, or maybe uh, hard to set up. It may require some time to get access to people, and we need to make decisions now. Oh, and uh, there's a bit of an asterisk here. Um, asking them has some uh, some problems, so let's just say let's include them. So, in the absence of having uh, users at our disposal, we create abstractions to help us out. So one of the most common abstractions would be a user segment. We take all the universe of possible people who'd be using our product, and we break them down into chunks. It makes them a little bit more manageable. And we start to describe them. We have our, the demographics of who these people are. Um, we might say that they're male, between the ages of 35 and 44, whether they're married, how much money they make, they graduate, blah, blah, blah. All the demographics we come up with. We might add to that uh, firmographics, which has to do with their place in the industry, and how, what kind of a career they have, and how much experience. Um, we have psychographics. 
which uh, sometimes are recall, uh, sorry, referred to as IAO variables, or uh, interest, activities, and opinions. So things that describe who they are as individuals. Um, and then we can merge all that with our behavioral data, what we collect from how they use our products. So this you know, would be our data analytics. Now, putting all this together starts to give us a good idea of who we're dealing with. And this is good information. It's useful for making broad market sizing decisions and kind of high level uh, product decisions. But there's a problem. It's very hard for us to relate to stories. Um, pardon me. Thank you, Shareware. Anyway, it's very hard for us to relate to data. If you've ever read this book by the Heath brothers, um, they, they very uh, profoundly make the case that it's not data that we, we relate to. Um, we don't do a good job of that. We relate well to stories. And the challenge when you're dealing with a segment is you've got all these people. And we have data around all these people, but it doesn't help us empathize with them. And if we can't empathize with them, we're still thinking in our own heads from our own perspective. So this is where a persona helps. Now a persona is a realistic profile that represents this segment. It's not one individual that we pull out of that segment. It's, it's an artificial creation. We take all the all those graphics and data that we have, and we put them all together, but we give it context and we make it feel real, so it becomes like a person that's with us. So we feel like almost like we are asking that person. Um, so instead of saying what I think the product should do, or what you think, or what you think, we start to think about well, what does Frank, the frequent trader, want? What does Mark, our marketing manager, want? And again, it's a good, great tool to get out of our own heads and then start thinking from another perspective. And that's the first benefit of personas, they give us empathy. They help us, again, out of our heads into someone else's. The other thing that personas can really help with is focus. You can't be all things to all people. So since a persona is a representation of people, uh, the general suggestion is that for any area of your product, you can really only have two to five personas that you're going to target. So that means there's lots of other potential customers that you're going to say, hey, if we satisfy them, great, but if we don't, we really have to pick these two to five, and I honestly usually like to go one to three. One primary and maybe two secondary personas. And those are the people we're really going to aim for um, with, with what we're doing. A great quote along those lines from Steve Jobs. Innovation comes from saying no to a thousand things to make sure we don't get on the wrong track or try to do too much. We're always thinking about new markets we can enter, but it's only by saying no that you can concentrate on the things that are really important. Lastly, personas bring consensus. Even assuming you have great interaction with customers, and usually within a company, lots of people do. Customer service talks to customers. Marketing might talk to customers. Maybe some product owners get out and talk to customers. But everyone does it in a little bit of a different way. So if you all agree on the personas you're focusing on, and make sure that everyone's thinking about the same person when you're having conversations. With so how do you bring these personas to life? You need some information. You've got to do some research. And there's basically two types of research you can do. You can do qualitative research. And this is uh, where you have direct engagement in small groups, or often even one-on-one, -on -one with people in your target segments. Um, we tend to focus on open-ended exploration and gathering real stories, real context uh, to build personas. What's really helpful with the qualitative is it tends to reveal unknowns, things you weren't aware of before. The downside is it's because it's very intensive is you end up with a small sample size. Some examples of the qualitative would be like usability testing, uh, contextual inquiry where you sit and observe people doing their day-to-day -day work, uh, focus groups, one-on-one -on -one interviews, that kind of thing. On the other side, you've got the quantitative. Massive amounts of data, which is great, high volume. The downside with the quantitative is you have a lot of what and very little why. And the why is very important if you're going to try and empathize with someone. So, example of surveys, business, analytics, uh, business intelligence, your analytics, etc. Ideally, you combine the both, the, the two of them. You validate your qualitative research with some quantitative data, or you flesh out the quantitative with some qualitative research. 
each one can lead into the other. You can have a, uh, a focus group or do some usability testing and find, you find something that you hear from maybe only three or four people. It feels right to you, but you want to validate that with a survey of a broader audience to see if it's applicable to more of your, uh, your user base. Or on the other side, you're noticing some anomalies in your data. It doesn't really make sense how, you know, what the usage data is telling you. So you might, again, gather some users and find out what their story is and, and why, what, what is causing that pattern so you understand it. Once you've got all that data, you can do your segmentation. Um, and it's a little bit art and science. Even though, even with the quantitative, you have a vast amount of uh, numbers to, to crunch, how, where you draw the lines is a little bit subjective. Because the goal here is to help you make better decisions. So, you know, maybe what differentiates them in a meaningful way is that they have different goals. Or uh, well, the demographics are different, or they have different activities, or they're coming to your product with different background and different experiences, or they have different behaviors when you're using the product. Any of these things are valid lines to demarcate different personas. Um, give you an example. Um, we have we created some personas for poker players, and they're differentiated by what motivates them to play. So we have a persona of people who want to make money. That's what they're there for. They just care about the problem. There's another persona that focuses on people who want to have fun. It's entertainment for them. There's another persona for people who want to master the game. It's about becoming an expert and being known as a skillful person. Now, these are great for marketing. It helps you attract them if you understand why they might be coming to you. But once they get into the registration process, why they want to play is not that useful. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So once you've got the data, then you want to tell your story. So you take that data and you make it more well-rounded. Um, you make them believable. So instead of saying we've got uh, a first-time home buyer, who's uh, it's, our first-time home buyers are between 20 and 32, tend to be more male, they have this, this income level, blah, 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 they've never bought before, they're renting, blah, blah, blah. You'd say, we've got, uh, we've got Fred, our first-time home buyer. Fred's an accountant. He's uh, been working at his firm for about five years. He's been staying out of the market you know, because of the, the housing dip. But he's, looking at, he's been looking at prices over the last few years, kind of saving properties, goes to an open house every once in a while, and he's thinking now might be the time to invest. So he's been looking online and, and figuring out what kind of properties he might want to live in, but also what might be good investments. Now we're starting to get a picture of someone. We can add in all that data we have, but they start to feel a little bit more real. Well rounded is good, you know, telling the story. Some people can get a little carried away. But Know what they had for breakfast, what their TV shows, TV shows are, whether they exercise in the morning, they have their pets. One or two details like that is fine. Again, it gives them a little bit of character. You know, going too many of those, and uh, again, it's distracting from the useful thing. There's another technique out there which talks about taking your personas to an extreme. Like if you had a persona who was on the religious side, make your persona the Pope. If you were dealing with law enforcement, go with Robocop. And the idea is that by going to an extreme, you might come up with ideas that you wouldn't, how this, what this person might need, that you wouldn't think of dealing with a more moderate um, persona. Now, I think this is interesting as an exercise, but I don't recommend that you do this for day-to-day -day personas. And the reason is, is caricatures are hard to relate to, and they're laughable. And you don't want to be in a position where you're laughing at your audience or at your users. You want to respect them, you want to relate to them, you're serving them. So again, it's useful if you want to try it, but once you try and get some good ideas, put it away. So at the end of the day, you might get something that looks like this. This is a persona I did a number of years ago. So we've got uh, up here, we have, this, we have this is a primary persona. We have Cheryl, the channel merchant, so that, okay, there's her priority. We have Cheryl, the channel merchant. And the, uh, the constants or alliteration just kind of helps make it memorable, because, uh, you know, wait, was Cheryl the, you have, you have like, Janet the channel merchant, or was Marjorie the channel merchant? Well, if it's Cheryl the channel merchant, then it just helps you remember who you're talking about. Um, we have a quote here that, that kind of expresses them, and a couple bullet points that kind of sum, sums up this persona. We have all that graphics information that, that we talked about. Most importantly, we, we, we fill up most of the page with their story, their context, how they come to the problem, what they do day to day, um, that, that kind of relevant information. And then to kind of and keep them in context. 
what a, a summary of their user goals, and then a summary of what the business's goals for this persona are. Now, that's one format, and you can do anything, whatever format works for you. The most important thing that I want you to take away from this is that it's one page. It's not a book. It's not you know, a multi-page Word document. It's one page. And what is great about one page is it's nice and portable. So if you have your three to five target personas, anyone can carry those three to five pages with them to every meeting. So again, you can easily reference them. You can put them up on the wall. Uh, there's uh, some people will make uh, trading cards out of them. So you have a little deck of a couple cards that represent your personas. And what this does is it just keeps them present. It keeps them in the forefront of people's minds. If it's, if it's a document that exists somewhere on a server in your email account, no one's ever going to read it. You want these things to be ever present so they get, they get used. Now that may sound like a lot of work. And it's not. I'm exaggerating it perfectly. Um, but the good news is, is you can actually start right now with what you have today, creating personas that would be valuable. And where this comes from, uh, I had a conversation with a former colleague who has done way more persona engagements than I have. And I said to her, how much do you think you know before you start, before you do the research, I mean you and the stakeholders, compared to what you find after you've done the research? She said, I think we know about 80%. That's a lot. That's good. I mean, it means we've got a lot that we can use right now to start bringing the teams together uh, and, and aligning on who we're focused, who we're targeting. So start with what you know. And this is called assumptive personas because they're based on the internal assumptions of the team. So I'm going to talk about some things you can do starting tomorrow to start creating assumptive personas based on what you know. Now, it may seem obvious, but it's very important to have clear business goals. This really is the foundation of everything else. You want them to be defined, measurable, and prioritized. You can all change later, but this is, this is the starting point. I'll give you a little bit of a sneak peek of what you can do um, once you've got that. Let's say we've got our top three business goals. Each business goal is going to have personas that help contribute to that business goal. Right? And each persona, being a user, is going to have their own sets of stories. Now think about managing a backlog. Usually we manage a backlog at this level, right? We have all these little stories that we're kind of constantly moving around in priority. If you've got this kind of relationship, if the world changes because if we learn something new about this persona, this persona is actually more important than this persona. But well, let's take this persona and its associated stories, and we can move them as a whole. And if we have larger changes, big business changes, that might have an even bigger impact. Well, you know what? This business goal just became more important than this one. Shift the whole thing. So again, it just lets us manage our backlog in a kind of a smarter, more strategic way. So the first thing to do, once you've got your business goal defined, is just brainstorm candidate profiles and goals. I'm not saying personas yet. Again, I'm going to leave it at profiles. They're not defined. They don't have that story yet. Um, create a big list. Just a high-level description about what might differentiate them. So you might say, yeah, let's go with a real estate example. We've got uh, a first-time home buyer, young first-time home buyer, comfortable doing research. We might have a a seasoned seller who's selling, you know, not selling his first property. Um, we might have a, a landlord who is a professional landlord and rents out you know, more than a dozen properties. So here, you know, we're I'm differentiating along a little bit on experience, a little bit on the number of properties they're dealing with. But the idea is just kind of in two to three sentences, what is something that describes it? You don't have to go through the whole, the whole list. The way I like to run this exercise is get everyone involved, everyone together in one room that has any kind of engagement with the project or engagement with the customers. So from developer to stakeholder, product owner, customer service, marketing, get as many people as you can together. And give everyone their own pad of stickies. And let everyone do this exercise kind of quietly by themselves. Everyone individually comes up with as many different candidate profiles that they can think of. And then you go and put them on the wall, quietly. Again, without talking. And if, if you've uh, two people come up with one that they feel is pretty much 
they think it represents the same thing, we'll just hack them together. So you start creating these groups that really represent you know, to, the, to the, the team there the same person, essentially. And then you might say, well, you know what, these two groups, they're kind of similar, they're related. Not the same, but we think that they're, they're related. They're close to we'll put those nearby. So you start to create this map of all your potential, your candidate profiles. Um, this, this is actually a really big one. We, uh, this, we were looking at a huge product, a huge product, and they really did have about 20 different roles that they, they came up with. This is also looking across their whole suite of products. Once you've got all those, you can, you can go back and map them to the business goals. And this will be helpful because the next step is to force prioritize them. We'll line them up, most important to least important, just like what we do in a backlog. Because when it comes to defining them, we're not going to define personas for all of them. We're going to start with the most important ones and go, and go down from there. Because some of the lower importance uh, profiles, they may be helpful to consider, but they may not be critical enough to warrant taking the time to give them the persona treatment. They might be fine uh, you know, as demographics, demographics, et cetera, as segments, as profiles. So, to recap. Oh, sorry, and then you, uh, and then define them. Create, really write, write their story, create their personas. Um, when you're doing this, don't bite off more than you need to. I started telling you about our marketing personas, right? You know, why do people play? Great for, for useful for our websites and for our marketing team, not so much when it gets into the product. So, there used to be this sense that you have one set of personas for your entire product. And if you can do the research to do that, great. It's a lot of work. If you're dealing with assumptive personas, and sometimes even if you're dealing with the research-based personas, you can sometimes think of having project-based or life cycle-based uh, personas. Uh, again, whatever helps you make better decisions. So for us, you know, we have our marketing personas, why people play. But when I get into registration, I'm less concerned about why they play, and I'm more concerned with how they made the decision to commit to my brand. Are they really ready to go through the registration process, or are they really evaluating this? That might be one way I would divide them. How do they feel about giving personal information? Are they, are they ready to give their credit card and deposit on our site? Are they ready to make a purchase or not? Again, that's more relevant in, in registration for us, and let alone when they're using the product. If someone who's playing the game of poker, um, how knowledgeable about them, are they about the game? Do they understand all the terminology? What kind of strategies are they using? All those will go into different design decisions, but they're different uh, for each area. So one individual may move through different personas at different points in their life cycle or as they interact with the product in different ways. And so you, so again, when I go back to saying you can't be everything to everyone, I'm still saying each area, each project has a limited focus on personas. Uh, even though once you've done a lot of work, you will end up with this library of different personas. You also might find that as you do that, certain ones cluster naturally. So you might start connecting them and creating those group of personas. The last thing to really give them that extra oomph, that extra bit to how to relate to them, is you got to give them a picture. And it just, we're, we're humans, we like looking in the eye, seeing faces. It's, it's what we're, we're bred to, to relate to. Now, you can always use stock photography, but a lot of stock feels a little bit, um, a little cold, it's a little posed. So uh, a really good resource for uh, persona pictures um, is online dating sites. <laughs> <laughs> because you can go in and specify what, um, you know, what demographic you're looking for, I'm looking for a male in you know, this age range, and you can go find them. Now, I do recommend do not use your own locale. You don't want to use your own locale. So, at least use it from like Colorado and Alabama. Um, but, you know, royalty free, and you will find real photos of real people. They're also for internal use only, so you don't you have to worry about, you know, about that. Um, but it really does make a difference having a good image that you can, that looks like a real person that you can relate to. I mean, this guy, you, you might have to crop him a little bit, because this guy right here, he's got his arm out around his imaginary lady friend that you know, he's looking for. But you know, if you crop that out, he looks like a nice account manager. Um, so, so how long have we been going?
long does that take? That this is something for persona process starting from business goals to having like at least a draft persona. If you get the right people in the room committed to it, we can do it in a day. And you know, I mean, I've been getting through a couple example of personas. I've done workshops where we've gotten teams through it that quickly. Now, right, really writing out the story and creating the deliverables, that might take a little bit of extra time. You can, you can create that foundation um, in less than a day. Once you've done that, like I said before, you want to distribute these far and wide. Um, I say announce them at a company meeting, but as these are individuals you want to relate to, the better thing you want to do is introduce them. Because these are now essentially part of your team. Uh, map posters around the office and conference room, anywhere where teams gather, put your personas. Print persona cards for people, or at least print out the, the one pages. Refer to them often. If someone says, I think or I want, reframe that question. Well, what would, you know, whatever the name of your persona is, what would they want? Uh, that starts, because you'll see the gears turn. That changes how people think about work. Now, you're not done yet. The most important part is, uh, is still to come. Like I said before, these are based on the assumptions of the team, based on the knowledge that you have at the moment. So next you have to identify what are your critical assumptions. What are the, the guesses that you've made where if you're wrong, things go badly? And these are the things that are most important to validate. And, um, now, no, no presentation will be complete without a four by four grid. Sorry, a two by two grid. So here's mine. Mm -hmm. um, so I have two axes: your level of uncertainty and the cost of being wrong. If your uncertainty is low and the cost of being wrong is low, go ahead. Don't worry about it. You'll figure, you know, you can you know, wait until after launch and kind of gather data. Then you're probably good to go. If uncertainty is high or the cost of being wrong is high, it's worth considering doing some of that research. Find out whether you're right or not. You've got some risk there. You can kind of see where this is going, right? <laughs> if the uncertainty is high and the cost of being wrong is high, this is something you really want to validate. Now, what kind of research makes sense depends on what kind of question you're trying to answer. If the assumption was, well, people really don't like our current problem, our current product, so we really need to redesign it. And you might say, well, maybe we should do a usability test to see, you know, do they really not like it? Or if they find this part hard to use, usability tests would be great for that. Um, people, yeah, uh, if you want to see that whether people hold a certain, another certain opinion that's not related to usage, maybe a survey makes more sense. Again, you want to tailor the research to the, the assumption you're trying to validate. If you have access to a, a good UX person, a good research, you know, someone who has experience with that research, they'll be able to tell what's the best technique to apply. So is this the assumption about the business goal or about the assumption you're making in the persona that you want to validate? So this is about an assumption in the persona uh, that, you, that you want to validate. Okay. So if, um, let me think of an example. Um, we, uh, we're in the midst, actually, right now, of uh, redesigning our poker table, right? And part of one of our internal assumptions is that people don't like the current design because it kind of looks like Windows 95. It's really outdated, it hasn't been touched in a while, and we think this is a big hindrance to us uh, acquiring the players and keeping the players we've got. Okay, well, what if we're wrong? If we're wrong, what maybe the people who are the players who have been dedicated to us for all these years, part of that dedication because there's something they like about that software, about that design. If we change that thing that they like, we now lose the dedicated players and maybe we still don't get the new ones. Right, so that's a critical assumption. I agree. It, it just um, it sounds like what you're describing is not an assumption about persona, but business initiative. Like it's not that Billy Big Bets wants the table design, it's you know that he, that we may be wrong about how uh, that we think like that's the thing I'm trying to sort out is how does that assumption surface in the personas? as opposed to the general sure. directive. So um, you can think about behavior maybe another another way to approach it. Um, I'm trying to think of an example that we've come across recently with the poker stuff or elsewhere. Um, I 
I might assume a part of I have an advanced player persona. Yeah. Um, these players use different third party tools um, to help gather data on their play. Right. Um, I assume that a more junior player is not using those tools. So if I have one interface, and we're actually making a different interface for advanced and beginning players. If I have one interface for advanced players where I have sort of left space for them to plug those tools in, and I have a interface aimed at uh, more recreational players that's more visual but doesn't have room for those tools at all, I'm making the assumption that those aren't the people aren't using them. So there, I found out that a significant portion were using those, I would have to rethink how I did that, the, the interface that was aimed at them. Is that, is that a better example? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, a quick recap. Define your goals. Brainstorm candidate profiles. Um, winnow those down to, so you can get rid of duplicates and kind of combine all your stages. Prioritize them. Create personas from your high priority profiles. Identify and validate your critical assumptions. That's the, the, basic, the basic process. To put this in context, I don't agree with much this guy has ever said, but there's one thing that he said that I thought was really brilliant, and surprisingly he got a lot of criticism in the music for it. And the gist of it was that you've got your known knowns, your known unknowns, and your unknown unknowns. And everyone gave him grief from it. No, that's exactly right. And this is where the assumptive persona fits in. These are based on your known knowns, what you know in the team. Your critical assumptions that you need to validate, those are your known unknowns, the things you're aware that you don't know or are wrong. The unknown unknowns, that's the 20% that you find out in the research. What I've found in my experience, this, that's what your competitors know as well. This is where the innovation lies. This is where you find out the things that other people haven't figured out, um, and you can do something different to differentiate your product. But again, it doesn't mean you can't get started with the 80% of what you already know. So, once you've got them down, you still want to do that research so you can learn that last 20% so you can really be innovative and, and create really meaningful personas. Now, if you have access to experienced researchers, great. But if you don't, you know, you give yourself it, and something's better than nothing. So some things you can do, just spending time with your users. Watch how they work. Uh, there's a company I, I worked with where I started a monthly customer visit. Once a month, myself and the product owner <coughs> go visit a customer and just sit with them and watch them use the product. And it was really hard for her not to tell them how to use it more efficiently. It's not a teaching session. It's a learning session for us. One way to think of it is you're an apprentice. They're the experts. They know their job. You're going to learn from them how they do their job and bring that back and use your expertise as a product designer or as an engineer um, to make a better product. So you know, spending a little bit of time at, okay, at the end, you can tell them, you know, give them some hints and then you find out how to use it. But, you know, spend time with your users. Look at your analytics, any data that you currently have access to. Um, and see what you can glean from that. And while there is an art to creating surveys to getting great answers, you can at least start, you know, ask some questions, get them out there. There's enough cheap tools available that uh, you can create your own surveys just to gather something from, from your audience. <coughs> so remember when I said there was an asterisk around ask them? Uh, sometimes direct a uh, asking doesn't always get you uh, what you think it will. But the problem is, is we're not always honest. Um, and the good thing, it's not usually intentional. There's often a difference between what we say and what we do. And sometimes we just leave things out because it doesn't seem important to us. And this is wh uh, where it's important to observe them, see what they actually do. Sometimes it has to do with how we see ourselves. We may have this certain image of ourselves that subconsciously we want to project, so we may edit, edit our story a little. And sometimes we just want to be nice. We just want to tell you what we think you want to hear. You know, you came all this way from your company to talk to me. I don't really want to give you bad news. It's fine. Really, no, it's good. Um, one of the, you know, again, one of the reasons of going there. 
you know, even look at what people are telling you and look at the body language they give you. Um, you were, uh, I'm assuming you used to go to the test. And you know, it's typical at the end of any task, you might ask them to say on a scale of one to five, with one being very easy and five being very hard, how did you like uh, that exercise we just went through? That guy went, one, it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> No, it wasn't you hated it. We watched you struggle through the whole thing. But no one wants to admit that they had problems, right? So again, looking at body language and the nonverbals can be sometimes as informative as what people are saying. Um, one other thing is avoid hypotheticals. Don't ask, what would you do in this scenario? Ask, what have you done in this scenario? Um, because that will give you a real answer. You know, uh, I, mean, I think my favorite example is, uh, you guys remember when the Segway launched? Remember that? You know, huge hubbub. This was going to change transportation as we know it. Because if you asked anyone, would you buy this awesome device that kind of self balances and drives around? Like, well, of course I would. But when it comes to reality, it's $5,000. And you know, um, I, I can either take the train or I ride my bike. It was $5,000. So, you know, I got bills to pay. When push comes to shove, now, I'm not, I'm not going to spend the money. So you could ask, what kind of transportation vehicles do you own? How do you get around now? Um, have you ever bought a scooter or you know, something comparable? Um, what are your issues with, with transportation? What problems do you currently have getting from point A to point B? And all those would give you some insight into the problem to what, what someone might want to solve it. Um, that would be much more reliable than asking, would you like to buy this product? All right, so now you're all probably chomping at the bit to get going and start creating your own something personas, but uh, we are not Jedi's yet. Um, <laughs> looks like you can. What's that? Looks like you can. Uh, so learning theory suggests that we go through four stages. Something is demonstrated, then we participate, we practice, and we perform. Sadly, all I've had time to do tonight is demonstrate. So. Um, Hopefully that you can take what you learned here and use it as a, a stepping stone to, to kind of jump off from to learn more about personas uh, and experiment with these exercises. But um, there's a, there's a lot here, a lot more, a lot more that you can learn and a lot more that you can do. Um, lastly, uh, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Apparently, some of you pay six dollars. Um, but I have spent uh, many hours preparing this presentation and down in Boston here to be with you, so I'm going to ask for a favor in return. So if you have a pen or a, a smartphone or some other capturing device, if you wouldn't mind getting it out, I'd greatly appreciate it. I'll give you more. If you wouldn't mind copying down that URL, I'd greatly appreciate it. And going with the agile value of continuous improvement, I can only improve with feedback. So I certainly look forward to hearing uh, any feedback that uh, you know anyone is willing to give me while we're here. But at this site, there's a page uh, which has a link to this talk, and you can go there and give feedback. Um, and I, you know, my ego loves the positive uh, feedback, but you know, to make this better, I need the critical feedback as well. So the more specific, the better. Um, so you'll see this page, and there is a link here for you as a user your stories for Agile New York. Can you put that news through the URL back up there? I okay. can. That's the shorter version rather than you know, the really long version. Mm. And now um, <coughs> I'd like to open it up for questions. And sure, in the whole transparency of Agile project, perhaps we can post the uh, the results of the, that survey. Oh yeah, no, it's all public. That would be awesome. Yeah. No, as soon as someone leaves, if the comments are public, I believe you can leave them anonymously. If the comments are public, the ratings are public. You know, as soon as you leave them, it averages out all the ratings. So I can't tell how I can see the comments <laughs> if you choose to leave your name, um, but I can't tell you know if you gave it a five or a one. You had a slide with So, I guess one of the I think one of the advantages of having the personas prioritized that you, you kind of have two choices: either figure out 
is there one persona that is the most important persona? So therefore, we want to make sure that we, even though that there might be five personas that will all go through that process or use that have the similar goal and value, mm -hmm. um, there's one persona that we want to make sure we satisfy. So we're really going to tailor it for them. Or you could take a different approach, which is even though it's not our most pers important persona, there's one persona who's going to do this the most, or it's the most important to them. Our number one persona, it's number three or four on their list, but our number two persona, that's their number one thing. So then you might want to write them there. Right? Mm. Uh, questions? When does, do you recommend refactoring, or how can you update the persona um, as time goes on? Whenever you learn something new, that's relevant. Um, now, at some point, you should get to a certain they should be being updated less and less. Yeah. You know, as you learn more and more, they should be changing less and less. Your market's changing, or you're finding new ones. There's always going to be good reasons to change. But if you find new information, you need to share it, update it. Um, yeah. Uh, and then the second one is around, um, do you recommend looking at users as well as, so how somebody who might have a negative intention might interact with the system as part of it, just like how a hacker might. Okay. Again, the ultimate goal is they help you make better decisions. Sure. So whoever it's going to be useful to keep in mind and to kind of, again, think from their perspective, make personas for them. Um, again, not so many that you get overwhelmed, because that's, again, we, we have people brains. We can only deal with so much content once. So again, the three to five is a good number of, of people that we can relate to and kind of keep in our work memory. Those are the back there. I think the concept of a subject persona is interesting because um, in the research and everything I've read about personas, there's a lot of push for them to be very quantitative or quantitative research driven, and that you're supposed to then discover what the personas are out of the output of that. Um, and so I like the concept that, you know what, if you want to sort of do it at a assumptive level first where you're speaking to your key stakeholders who have the most interaction with those <laughs> customers, and you put that set together, and then you figure out, okay, well, what are the things that, what are the elements of those personas that I need to focus the research on. Yeah. Um, my question is, how do we ensure that our stakeholders that we're talking to and eliciting these personas from are uh, being objective um, and that yeah. they are in adding their level of subjectivity well, into that? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a starting point, and they're going to be the ones who are likely going to be giving you final feedback anyway. So it's, it's, it's the best starting point you have. So go with it. at least. If they're the stakeholders, everyone's aligned to what they're going to be looking for. Start with that. Now again, you can moderate that with the critical assumptions. And you know, we want to avoid risk more than we seek reward. So if you want permission to do research to validate personas, rather than talking about how, or how much we're going to learn and how, how great the features will be, that's nice, but it won't get you very far. If you talk about the risk side, if we're wrong, this project is dead. Whoa. Okay, maybe you guys should uh, should figure that out, right? You, you're much more likely to get get the permission to do that research if you emphasize the risk than the uh, than the reward. It's, I mean, it's again psychology. Uh, how do you evaluate? Um, what are the metrics after the project is done? I mean, do you go back and say these personas were good or bad, or have you found them to be not useful, or is it generally something that kind of dissipates as you get to the use cases and something else? I mean, I think the metrics are going to be, you know, whatever you decide for the business goals, that's what you would use your metrics on. I think how, how useful the personas are, I think is like, how well do they help you make decisions? And if they're not helping you make decisions, maybe they weren't sliced right, or maybe you need a, need a slightly different set. And I said, again, we kind of felt that way when we were, we, our, when I got there, they had already done the personas about why, how, why people play poker. And we started using those kind of things. These tell me nothing about the project I'm on. They're just not helpful. So I need to do something different because I'm not getting what I need out of these. So that's, that, I think that's the best metric. I mean, is it making your life easier? Or if it's causing more churn, then they're not the right personas. Now, whether you need to throw them out wholesale or you know, get validates some information, that's going to depend on, on the context and you, know, you as you, know, you and your team figuring that, that part out. 
uh, just in response to that, thinking about things that have heard about a pivot in terms of yes. uh, lean stuff like startups, you know, the pivot, it seems like, is there a pivot point with personas? Or? <coughs> so I could see the, the pivot point with personas being the target ends up not being what you thought it would be. So it might be while you're validating that assumption, it's like, huh. In the context of this, I'm learning other things that doesn't really fit with what I thought. Or you're looking at your data and you're going, well, I would have expected the behaviors to be this way, but they're different. Um, and so at least like there's the intermediate, uh, there's a stage there when you say, that what are your assumptions, validate your assumptions, you might try to come up with a way to pivot or find a, yes. yeah, do something to bring in real data. Yeah, again, that's what I said, depending on how, you know, again, I was just using risk and uncertainty to do that. But for, these personas are a starting point. They're not, they're not the end point, and I would expect them to change fairly significantly over time as you, as you learn new things. Uh, so one of the things that I uh, thought about when I was uh, putting perspective for me uh, that you mentioned was um, tying them, you know, from business goal down, so down stories. I'm just going to go back to what I said earlier. Like if, if that persona is, is helping you make good decisions, it's, it's useful. And if it's not helping you make good decisions, not very useful. I guess and I'm looking you, for in your experience. Is that I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm like, okay. it, no, no, just talk, <laughs> talk a little bit more. Well, so at our company, I think there's a push to, um, let's make some company-wide personas. Yeah. And I'm worried that that's going to be useless. And until we do it and find out, we won't know. But that may have been a waste of time. And so I'm wondering if you can lend your experience and you know, is it worthwhile to push back on that and challenge that, or have you found that that can work? Oh, it can definitely work. It just tends to, um, it tends to require more effort. Because like, I'll, I'll go back to my poker example. If I've got why they play poker, and you know, how comfortable are they giving personal information and depositing, and how much do they understand about the game as you know, three different areas. If I do the Uber research, I might find, you know, whereas I have like three in each, I might find the threads that connect them. So I am able to do one persona that's about a fun player who, um, you know, is very comfortable you know, giving his financial data, but doesn't really know much about you know, the, a lot of the terminology. And that might, you know, the research might show me that that is one person. Whereas if I don't have all that, it's a little easier to kind of just deal with the, the silos for, for each little project rather than try and imagine what all the possible combinations might be. Does that, that make more sense? Okay. All right. A couple more, maybe. So, um, who do you 
typically, and, and I know like there are many different roles that can write these, but who do you typically see authoring and quote owning the persona process for lack of better choice of words? Well, who I see doing it, because if I see them doing it, it means I'm there. And as a UX person, you know, it's something I tend to be involved in, so I'm usually the one doing it. Uh, I, I like to involve uh, a stakeholder of some kind, so an agile is usually a product owner. Because any research or other things I do, I want them to be a part of. Um, but a lot of times I'm bouncing it off of customer service, uh, product, others marketing, other stakeholders to get as much input uh, as I can. Uh, great. great talk. Thanks a lot. Um, I come from the UX background and familiar yeah. with Persona UX in a non agile environment. And I think you said early on that you are working with Persona in an agile focused environment. Yeah. Are there, um, can you characterize some of the differences in persona and agile as opposed to persona otherwise? So I'd say the biggest difference is kind of why I kind of chose this topic of assumptive, to focus on the assumptive personas versus the, the, the big research base and talking about like a monthly customer visit versus a big uh, research initiative is what I'm looking to do are uh, small pieces that can be slipped into the process rather than large initiatives that are going to take up a lot of time. So that's kind of, how, what are the low friction activities that I can do that, to add value to the team quickly, rather than in sort of waterfall where I know I'm going to get six weeks to research, and then 12 weeks to design, and then you know, six months to build, uh, where I have that luxury of being able to devote to, to the research. I don't have, I rarely have that in an agile context. Um, so my question is also about that similarities with other um, so, um, in my previous year of experience, in use cases, we have actors, and actors proved to be quite efficient. So, uh, from your standpoint, what's the difference, and if there is a difference, um, by a persona rather than actors, which are the roles, and also So, I don't, um, I have very high level experience with UML models. I did a little bit of it a couple years ago. Um, and I, so, my experience might not be relevant to someone who has much more UML experience. But from what I saw, the difference being it was that ability to empathize and really relate to them as individuals versus just being this sort of generic role. That I kind of I can think of them, I can imagine them as people, <coughs> and that helps me put myself in their shoes a little bit more. So even if in that UML diagram, if you wanted to stick a persona there, fine. You know, that would be great. I think it like gives a little bit more color to that, that UML diagram. Just do one more. One more. Okay. Right. Anyone who has who I haven't talked to you yet? All right. Go ahead. All right. Um, is there a resource, free or low cost, that you can go to to get demographic information or um, behavioral information? You know about an industry or type, because you really you might be able to see that and, and immediately begin to form some assumptions. I, I would love to hang out your industry and we have a much better access to the tools. But uh, uh, like the one one resource that comes to mind is it's very specific was um Charlie Lee who wrote uh, the name was taken uh, basically on social social media engagers and they did a survey by by country, like what percentage of people and what age groups were collectors versus content creators versus consumers of content. So that was like one resource if you were dealing with you know, social media that you that you could go to. But that's again a very specific uh, example. Um, you get quite different for every industry. Sure. Um, just two things came to mind in beyond what you're talking about. One of them is Amazon and the reason two they have a um, so they want people to explore with data ultimately. Yeah. And um, I can't remember the right words to search for, like do EC2 and data sources, uh, maybe throw in demographics for good measure. But they have a lot of interesting stuff from scientific data to financial data. Um, and I think there's some demographic stuff that I've seen up there, or maybe some psychographic info. Um, but then also, like, you know, sort of the standard shops like Experian. Are they? Like Ex Experian? No. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, experience is probably the biggest, especially if you want to like from well, libraries like Sybil have a lot of databases that are just for cost, but they're there. 
I mean, it, it, I mean, the scheme of things, if you're buying, my experience in buying demographic data, like, it's cheap. You know, I mean, like, you know, I don't mean it's like zero cheap, but if you've got an enterprise and you want to buy the data on five million people, you know, relative to like what the sales of an organization are, it's, it's, like, it's like a revenue error. Unfortunately, we've got to cut it here. Uh, we always want to make sure you guys get out if you want to, et cetera. If you want to stick around a little bit and uh, check with uh, Jeremy a little bit one-on-one, -on -one, uh, that's what we usually do.